So my name is Joe Bingham. I'm going to talk about some ICS vulnerabilities that we found. Uh, I'm on the zero day research team at Tenable. There's only about five or six of us. And uh, what we're going to talk about is in the last year or so, we've been looking at a lot of ICS products, uh, different SCADA targets for software and hardware. Um, and we found about a dozen critical vulnerabilities just kind of scattered across the board. Um, and they're critical vulnerabilities because they provide unauthenticated or uh, pre-auth remote code execution in the affected systems. Uh, so in, in, as we go through this talk here, I'll describe four of them in a little bit of, a little bit of detail and then, uh, and then we'll blow up a power plant. All right, so the first one uh, that we'll look at is in Siemens Step 7, uh, which Step 7 has been around forever. They rebranded it as uh, TIA Portal, and uh, it's automation services. It's used in all aspects of ICS development and operation from design phase to implementation and all the way down to operations. So TIA Portal has a suite of simulation tools uh, it does diagnostics in telemetry. It does energy management. So they use it in operation in all sorts of different industri industries, down on the plant floor, uh, just for monitoring equipment. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, bu it's built for use by engineers, built for the integrator, as well as built for the operator personnel. So the vuln that we found in the software exists in the authentication package of the server. Uh, it has a Node.js server and TIA Portal implements functionality for authentication, to, for authenticating web users and administrators. Uh, after authentication, the SSL session is switched over to WebSockets, but they don't use this, the token that's uh, validated in authentication in the WebSockets session. So, of course, you can just skip HTTP authentication and start sending WebSockets commands directly to the server and it will process them. And of course, all administrative functionality is included in the WebSockets protocol. So what can you do with that? You could do a number of things. Uh, you can basically do anything that an administrator would want to do with, on the system. Uh, but the best thing that an attacker would want to do is just start a firmware update and you can specify the firmware update server. So basically you can just uh, ask the server to execute any remote URL. You could also do a couple other things like modify permissions for users, create new users, uh, or you could just change application proxy settings, collect system information. Um, so, so we have a disastrous security hole in this Siemens software that's used on the plant floor uh, in critical operations. Uh, and as we go through these vulns, you know, I'm going to have uh, different POCs, and those are all on our Tenable uh, GitHub repository. You can find exploits for all of these vulnerabilities. And um, I guess while we're talking about Siemens, uh, at, earlier today at Black Hat, we had uh, University of Tel Aviv. We're looking at the somatic PLCs, and they found some other crazy vulnerabilities in those that you know, basically anyone can come and, and reprogram the PLCs uh, if it's set up with the default permissions, because they all share private keys. So. Siemens kind of, I don't, I don't know what to say about Siemens. Second one is in uh, Schneider Electric that we'll talk about, uh, Indisoft Web Studio. So earlier this year, we found that Indisoft has several vulnerabilities, including one that allows attacker to uh, send unauthenticated commands to the application. And specifically, this command 66 uh, is used to uh, configure the database connection for Indisoft. And in many of the code paths, the file name can actually be user supplied. So in this command 66 message, an unauthenticated attacker can specify a database configuration file and ask the server to update from that file. And then the Indisoft server parses the malicious update file and executes these wrap brackets as WinExec. So an attacker could specify arbitrary commands inside of this database configuration file to run remote code on uh, any Indisoft web server studio. And here's, so our proof of concept for this was just basically uh, to, in Python, sets up a, a local uh, SMB server, requests the Indisoft Web Studio to uh, trigger a database configuration update, pointing to the controlled SMB server. The server requests the database configuration file and then runs a command based in it. And we just used it to pop a calculator ex uh, application. And that's available on the, on the GitHub. All of these will be. 
All right, so the third phone, it, also in Schneider Electric, but in hardware. So the Motocon Quantum PLC, or kind of like a ubiquitous PLC hardware used all over the place, different industries. And they're, they're favorites because they're modular. You can kind of plug and play them. They have all sorts of different modules in them. Um, they're kind of interchangeable, slide them into the housing, housing, depending on what the needs of your application are. So one of the vulnerabilities that we found in these PLCs, specifically in the communications PLC, is uh, that there's authentication bypass in the, com in the communications module, uh, which would allow an attacker to administer the device without credentials. And here's the exploit for that. Uh, there it is, pretty easy, right? So apparently zero day is easy. Uh, this this uh, PLC uses uh, just the hidden, hidden, hidden service API of the communications device to just change the uh, administrator, administrator password without, authentic without authentication. All right, last one. Uh, this vulnerability is in Rockwell Automation, RS Lynx. Uh, and RS Lynx Classical, is, it basically implements Ethernet IP and encapsul encapsulates the common industrial protocol SIP messages. Uh, so then in their uh, implementation, the packet has a 24-byte header followed by some command-specific data. Uh, now the header lists the command and the length of the command-specific data. So the vulnerability exists. Uh, it's a stack overflow caused by a malformed connection path where there's a function in the library, engine.dll engine library in RS Lynx, which parses a connection path to extract a port path and stores it in a buffer on the stack. The length isn't verified, and so you can specify up to 256 bytes of the port path and overflow the stack address, and in 32-bit windows, I think the return address is like 200 bytes or so from the beginning of the buffer. So a pretty easy, pretty easy stack overflow. All right, that's it. I hope that wasn't too bad. So let's look at the fun part, which will be the application of these vulnerabilities, and I chose to kind of look at a nuclear power plant. So let's see. First things first, let me turn you guys into nuclear, nuclear physicists in one minute. Nuclear fission, it's a process where a large nucleus splits into two smaller nuclei. So when it splits, it releases energy, right? And in the case of nuclear fission in these power plants, we use, the, we use uranium-235. Uranium-235 splits into krypton and it splits into barium. And with that, it releases three more neutrons and it releases heat each of those neutrons can start another chain reaction, and that's fission, that's it. So uranium-235 is a really nice isotope of uranium, uh, where 238 is the naturally occurring one. Uh, so when you hear about people enriching uranium, they're adding more 235 to the 238 natural, natural fuel. And that makes it uh, more, makes it more uh, chain reactive. So remember the neutrons that are produced, those three neutrons in the reaction, uh, those are exactly how the fission reaction is controlled, and those are like the most important part of the chain reaction. So we know that the fission reaction creates heat, and the heat is used in these power plants to boil steam, to boil water, which creates steam, and then the steam turns a turbine. And that's it, that's how the power is created. So one minute, right, you're experts. I don't know why they even teach this in school, you can just Google it, like I don't know, why is, why is nuclear engineering a thing? Just kidding. Okay, so the key players in the nuclear reactor. For number one, we have the fuel. That's the basis of the fission chain reaction. In uh, nuclear power, it's uranium in general, sometimes plutonium, but almost all the time uranium. That's the thing that releases heat. It's the key element of fission. We have the moderator. That guy's job is to just slow down the fission reaction by absorbing neutrons. Each of those three neutrons that came out when the nucleus splits, the moderator stops maybe two of those to continue the chain reaction. Now the coolant, its only job is just to take heat away from the core, that's it. The heat is the energy. And then the fourth guy is the control, that's the referee in the game. So you have, you have uh, when the game starts getting too crazy, the fission reaction is getting, control, getting out of control, you drop in the control elements. And so the control elements will generally be cadmium, hafnium, boron, all of those materials absorb massive amounts of neutrons, so they just completely stop the fission reaction in seconds or minutes, uh, almost always within seconds. And we'll talk about those more in detail. But let's get into first the some of the different designs in nuclear reactors. There's there's a lot of different designs. Um, 
and I'll go through like four or five of them. The first one is the pressurized water reactor, or PWR. Uh, this is by far the most prevalent reactor uh, that's in use in the entire world. In almost all of the uh, power plants in the U.S. are these. They're used in, in France. They're also used in Japan, Russia, China. Uh, and as time goes on, there more and more, more of them, more and more of them go online just because they're so stable. And then its little brother is the boiling water reactor, which is basically the same as the pressurized water reactor, except that steam isn't created inside of the core. Steam is actually created in a separate heat exchanger. So the reactor is fully liquid. All right, now for the BWR, I'll talk a little bit about the safety systems. Um, this is a diagram of an existing one in Japan, the Kashiwazaki Kariwa. Uh, BWR in Japan. It came online uh, like within the last decade or so. And uh, the control systems and the instrumentation, they're all on the same network. Of course, it's an air gap network separate from, you know, the, the corporate intranet and even, you know, one step further from the, uh, from the wide internet. And so uh, you can see that in this diagram, the, the uh, computers, are, the control systems are all fully, fully automated fully computer controlled, they have separate response systems, and uh, they have redundant safety systems in them. The emergency core cooling system, which is in the lower left, the ECCS, and then the SCRAM control rod insertion, those are the two referees, the control elements to shut down the reaction. That's right below it to the right of the ECCS. A uh, third type of reactor design is the pressurized heavy water reactor, uh, and they call it it's almost all of them are in Canada. They call it the CANDU. It's kind of a modification of the PWR. Um, and it's a little bit of a different design because instead of uh, light water, which they call our, the PWR and the BWR are like light water reactors. It uses normal water, filtered water. These ones use heavy water, which is like du deuterium, which is another hydrogen isotope. And deuterium already has the extra neutron that light hydrogen would have absorbed. So there's res reduced neutron absorption, which makes it easier to sustain the chain reaction. And so that makes it so they can use a different kind of fuel. They don't have to use enriched uranium. So they can use naturally occurring uranium or lower concentration of enriched uranium. Uh, but the downside and the cost of that is you know, that the fuel is cheaper. But on the other hand, <clears throat> the design is much less stable. So you end up with these circumstances where uh, reactivity can increase as the water starts to boil in, um, in kind of these edge cases. And what that means is that an attacker that has modification access in this presumed attack scenario can actually uh, control these, these safety systems to create a situation in the core where the fission reaction can can occur in what, what they call a runaway fission reaction where uh, reactivity increases and it's like a feedback loop. As the temperature keeps going up, the fission reaction keeps going up and uh, that's exactly what happened in Chernobyl, if you're familiar with that. All right, so in the, in the PWR, uh, the PHWR, the can-do uh, nuclear power plant, because of those, you know, they're aware that they can have this reactivity runaway, obviously, so the safety systems are incredibly durable, so they say. Um, this is a diagram here from the US NRC. The United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission generally does studies on what they call diversification in the safety systems, and diversification means that there are not common, common ways that they can fail, right? Like one vulnerability can't shut down both safety systems. So um, in this case, we have two, two referees, two of these safety systems, SES-1, which is the absorption rods which drop into the core, and they're made of boron. They drop into the core and s completely shut off the fission reaction. And SDS-2, which is boric acid injection, where there's like several injectors on the side of the nuclear core where they just spray in boric acid to uh, increase the level of bor boron inside of the liquid, which also absorbs all the neutrons, immediately stopping the fission reaction. Um, so the point, I guess, is that the CANDU system relies on computer control through two of these redundant computers that, that manage information and alarms. Uh, they're all on the same network, though, right? So you still have this same access vector, 
Um, but the two critical safety systems use different operating systems. Uh, they use different architectures and processor hardware. They use different languages. They're not allowed to use the same languages or executables. So, for example, you know, the absorption rods will run on Windows, and the boric acid injection runs on Linux. The you know, SDS-1 runs uh, with Fortran, for example, and SDS-2 runs with C++. So that's what they call diversification in nuclear power plants. So even so far, though, uh, as being developed and coded by separate teams. So like the software will have same design parameters, but coded by different people and run by different teams. Um, so in the end, you know, all it, all it means to us is that you need you know, one, maybe two more zero days to, to exploit the system, right? But don't worry, you can use some of the ones that we found. All right, the second to last reactor type is the AGR. I just have to mention it. It's, you know, like the fourth, the fourth most popular one used. Um, the advanced gas reactor, they use these in the UK. It uses uh, natural uranium and they, you know, to deal with like this problem of liquid boiling in the core and that causing a problem, these what they call void coefficients, increasing reactivity, they just said, let's not use liquid, we'll just use gas. So they use carbon dioxide in there as a coolant and you don't have to worry with stuff boiling. So there's no such thing as, uh, there's no such thing as void coefficient issues. Uh, and it's also pretty stable, you know, it's comparable to the PWRs and the BWRs. Uh, and there's, yeah, those are in the UK. And then the last thing that obviously we have to mention is the Russian RBMK, which is just this horribly unstable design. They still use like three of them. I, that's a typo. I think there's only three of them in Russia. Um, they use natural uranium, which, you know, as temperature goes up, the uranium reactivity increases, which is a bad thing. It uses graphite as a moderator and water. It has a positive void co coefficient, meaning that as the liquid in the core boils off and creates steam, you get, you get uh, steam between the fuel rods instead of liquid, which increases reactivity. So as heat goes up, reactivity goes up, which is basically, that's why Chernobyl exploded again. You know, so horrible design. I, they're trying to phase all of these out. Russia starts, has started in the last uh, decade or so putting PWRs, but they still have some of these in action. Okay, so attack scenario. I'm gonna, I think I have to start going a little faster here. So we got about 10 minutes. Um, so the attack scenario, right? The network is going to be an air gap network. You want to protect it. You have all this critical, very fragile equipment on this network. Um, so we're going to have it air gapped. So we need some kind of initial, in initial infection into some adjacent network, could be a corporate or employee network. Uh, and that's not too, <clears throat> it's fairly trivial, obviously. Once we're in the adjacent network, some kind of human interaction or other propagation zero day would allow us into their control network. And we've seen this before. Like, I feel like I don't need to spend too much time on this. You know, Stuxnet use a Windows Vuln over USB to jump the gap. And then there's a lot of different ways that we've seen in other malware like Triton uh, that, that do this. So once we're in the network <clears throat> and we're running on an operator panel, for example, one of the, or, or one of the peripheral systems, we need to get onto a controller. That's where we actually have access to the PLCs, access to the control network, access to some of the safety systems. Um, so what we do is we use another vulnerability. For example, the first one that I talked about, the one of Siemens, in general, you have these controllers on the operational floor which are interfacing with the PLCs for data collection, for telemetry, and, f and in the development cycle for programming the PLCs. So we use that Siemens vulnerability. Uh, immediately to jump from the operator interface, this peripheral device, onto the, onto the controller. And once you have access to the controller, modifying PLC logic becomes trivial. So in production environments, you, could, you can accomplish that in a number of different ways. The malware implant could wrap, for example, the communications through the controlling server to modify control flow for automatic function changes, which is similar to what we saw with Stuxnet. Uh, and then for, for our attack in the power plant, we just need to be able to stop the coolant pumps, number one. That reduces heat exchange out of the core. That's the most dangerous thing. As the core temperature increases, it's going to start to melt down. And in other extreme cases of the horrible design, designs uh, that I talked to you about, some of the really bad designs, uh, fission reactivity increases, which is, you know, within minutes you could have some disastrous ex explosion. Um, 
So we need to stop the coolant pumps, that's number one, stop heat transfer out of the core. And then secondly, we need to be able to, to withdraw control rods to increase fission. And then thirdly, we need to be able to stop these safety systems, the safety systems where the control rods are inserted or boric acid is sprayed in. And those are on different redundant systems but they all go, go through some common logic collector, which ends up being the thing that decides whether or not to turn on the safety systems. So another integral part of creating a successful attack on one of these power plants is by providing false telemetry to the operators. So you provide them the illusion of control to uh, the people that are monitoring the safety systems, that are monitoring the, monitoring the temperature controls and the pressure, the pressure displays. Uh, you tell them everything's okay inside of the core while, while in reality um, you know, things are reaching some critical threshold. But during that time period you don't want anyone to respond. So you buy yourself some time to uh, create this awful situation where fission can uh, go onto this runaway, uh, runaway, path, runaway path. So it can happen, you can do that by simulating logic inside of the implant to send cal pre-calculated temperatures or even you know, real-time simulated temperatures and pressure and power readings based on the operator's commands. Uh, and so as the plant operator attempts to move control rods, for example, to control the fission reaction, the implant sends back simulated signals to say yes, the control rods are moving even though we have control of them. All right, and then the last and um, other critical part of the attack is to disable the critical and redundant manual and automatic safety measures. So the malware can replace logic inside of the ECCS and as well as the scram control rod insertions, and those are the two uh, independent and diverse safety systems that we talked about. That's an NRC regulation. All power plants do that. They have uh, separate but, you know, separate, not equals, just separate systems um, which are able to completely shut down the fission reaction. And by, by disabling the safety systems, we allow you know, that extra five minutes or even an hour in some cases to provide the reactor core to, to set it onto this path where it's gonna eventually melt down or explode. So worst case scenario, uh, I'll talk about the RBMK that since there's still three of them in action. Uh, they're all in Russia but they're extremely unstable. They have this um, design parameter where fission can end up on this thermal feedback loop which makes fission just uh, run out of control. Um, they, re they rely entirely on logical control systems inside of the control networks to maintain stability. So if an attacker ach achieves control of the safety and control system, they could very easily cause a catastrophic explosion. Another design a uh, power plant that would be vulnerable, vulnerable is the CANDU or the PHWR, which is that depressurized heavy water, which uses deuterium. Uh, and those are used in Canada and India. They're more stable than the RBM <coughs> RBMKs, but they're still less stable than the light water reactors we use in the U.S. Um, because they use unenriched uranium as fuel, the fission reactivity can increase and have a runaway fission reaction. And then the last case that we have to talk about is in the U.S., so while th these these power plants are much more stable, you know you can't you can't have this runaway fission reaction where you could have actually like some crazy fission explosion inside the core, but you can still melt them down. So that, so Fukushima, or and uh, Three Mile Island, those were both light water reactors, and um, all the only reason they melted down was because the coolant stopped. Uh, they use light water as a moderator, and so they're designed to make it impossible to create a circumstance where the fission reaction would grow uncontrolled. Uh, and as the conditions of fission increase, reacti reactivity always decreases. As water pressure goes up, the fission reaction slows down. That's how they're designed. They're kind of like something, you know, they're not designed to be, they're designed for stability first and cost later. So, Ending the talk, I guess I'll just say that, you know, the talk is kind of based on fear, uncertainty, but, you know, as I studied and looked through this, you know, I found nuclear power is good. It's, it's uh, clean energy. Almost one-fifth of all of the power in the U.S. is created through nuclear. So, you know, I just have to throw that in there. And uh, I should also say that this type of attack, you know, using our vulnerabilities could have been used on, you know, or simulated. I could have chose any industry and we could have a similar kind of crazy disastrous effect. Um, so it's not necessarily nuclear power that's bad, right? It's kind of like the vulnerabilities and keeping a reminder on these, these critical systems to say that basically everything is vulnerable.
All right, so remember to check out our uh, GitHub. We have all the PLCs for these exploits on there. And um, you can ask me any questions you want. I'll be on Twitter, available on there. And thank you guys very much.